Welcome to my channel. Welcome back to my channel. About three years ago, in my VO workshop, with all the voice talent that I get to work with, I had the bright idea to, uh, to assign homework. <laughs> Every month we, uh, we do a project, and, and, and it's optional. Participation is optional. But every month it's, it's a different genre, and it's an opportunity for voice talent in my group to, to, showcase, their, uh, to showcase their talent, to showcase what they can do. And we, again, we change it up every month. It's a, a different genre. And this month we did long-form narration, which is something we did last year, and we returned to it this time. And so long-form narration is basically... You can almost say everything except commercial or, or IVR. Um, documentary. Uh, audiobook is a great example of long form narration. E learning. Basically, it's storytelling. And whether it's a paid booking or maybe something that you wanted to create, uh, if you produce for your own uh, creative edification, I had to ask voice talent to submit a sample between one minute and three minutes. Uh, a little bit longer samples this month, and this way you kind of have a more realistic feel for the genre. And because this month's video will be longer, I put timestamps uh, in the video description for your convenience. If you're interested in joining an upcoming VO challenge, uh, message me. Why don't you take a single class with me, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching class or as part of one of my group sessions. I invite you to join my private group of voice talent. Uh, within that group, I send you one email a month and in that email is the schedule for the upcoming classes for the for the weeks to come, as well as details for the VO challenge of that given month. So it's, uh, it's that's how you can join us. And of course, it's always optional. But as you can see, a lot of people participate and it's it's good fun. So reach out to me. So again, all that was required was your voice. You don't have to produce a video, but I've said this in recent uh, in recent monthly postings that voice talent are learning how to produce videos. And so if you have that, great. But know that to participate in the VO challenge, it's not required. Uh, music and sound effects, that's, uh, again, it's optional because sometimes for an audiobook, it's sometimes it's just your dry voice. Although I hear that's changing these days. Uh, but if it's a fully produced project, and again, maybe something that you booked, well, Heck yeah, send me that. So, let's enjoy. In random order, here are the submissions for the VO Challenge of March 2024. In the vast expanse of the universe, each one of us is born with a spark. A flame burning within us, waiting to illuminate the world. It's like having a treasure buried deep within, waiting to be discovered. But often we find ourselves lost in the labyrinth of doubts and fears, unsure of how to unleash our true potential. Imagine a seed lying dormant in the soil, waiting for the right conditions to sprout and grow. Similarly, within each of us lies the potential to blossom into something extraordinary. But just as the seed needs nourishment and care, our dreams and aspirations require dedication and perseverance to flourish. It's natural to feel overwhelmed by the enormity of our dreams. Doubts may creep in, whispering tales of impossibility. But remember, every great achievement began with a single step, a leap of faith into the unknown. Think of the countless individuals who dared to defy the odds, who refused to be confined by the limitations imposed upon them. Their stories serve as beacons of hope, guiding us through the darkest of nights. You see, inspiring others isn't about grand gestures or lofty speeches. It's about igniting the flames of passion within their hearts, empowering them to believe in themselves. It's about lending a helping hand to those who have stumbled along the way, reminding them that they are never alone in their journey. So, my dear friends, as you embark on your own quest to greatness, remember this. The power to achieve lies within you. Embrace your uniqueness. Embrace your dreams. And above all, embrace the limitless potential that resides within your soul. For when you dare to dream, when you dare to believe, you inspire others to do the same. And together, we can create a world 
where anything is possible. When you think about the U.S. Marshal Service, images of Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, saddling up trusted Palominos and heading westward at dawn to track down desperados probably spring to mind. You'd be right. But the U.S. Marshals have been profoundly involved in our nation's history for more than 230 years now. In 1789, George Washington signed the Marshal Service into existence, giving them a unique law enforcement role with far-ranging jurisdiction. Marshals, their deputies and sometimes assembled posses, helped create our America by bringing order to the Western frontier. As our nation has evolved, the portfolio of the Marshal Service has evolved too. U.S. Marshals were on the front lines during the Civil Rights Movement, protecting James Meredith when he registered at Ole Miss. They escorted the McDonough Three, Leona Tate, Tessie Prevost, and Gail Atien, along with Ruby Bridges, when they integrated elementary schools in New Orleans. They protected peaceful marchers from Selma to Birmingham. Marshals helped enforce the prohibition of alcohol in the 1920s and apprehended infamous gangsters. They protected our country's borders during the World Wars and carried out exchanges of spies with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Marshals run the Federal Witness Protection Program, transfer federal prisoners, and protect federal judges. They were among the first on the scene during 9-11 and its aftermath. They even found and brought in El Chapo. The U.S. Marshal Service tends to work in the background, unseen. Now a museum dedicated to preserving their role in our history is being created. We've managed to construct a facility that matches the beauty and scope of the museum's educational mission. In fifth grade, we learn how to square dance with our assigned partners. My partner is Gregory, an olive-skinned white boy with raven dark hair. In the center of the classroom, boys and girls face each other, giggly and jitterly, with anticipation. We nervously wait for the square dance music to begin. Gregory stands with his hands on his narrow blue jean hips. His thin lips are curled in disgust at the sight of me. I am not the partner he wanted. When we square dance, we will have to touch. When we square dance, we will have to be close. I liked Gregory until this moment, when his eyes calmly, purposely erased me, and I stand squirming in my new dress worn just for the occasion. I glance down the aisles of boys, wondering who else could be my partner. When Miss Willis places a needle onto the record and the classroom fills with the sound of ruckus, cheerful fiddle music, Gregory and I tentatively reach for each other's hands. We are reaching for each other's across a centuries-old chasm of history and hate and hope and fear. When he touches my fingers, Gregory jumps back and ostentatiously wipes his hands on the side of his jeans, as though now his hand will never be clean again, and walks back to his desk and sits down. I stand partnerless, exposed as what I saw in Gregory's eyes. Not a girl. Not his classmate, but a black and ugly and dirty thing. Module 3, Conflict Resolution in the Office. In this video, the supervisor, Sue, has called Rob into her office. This follows a big company meeting where Sue announced a major decision and Rob expressed his disagreement to the attendees. The following are two possible approaches to resolving the conflict between these co-workers. Let's observe scenario one as Sue addresses the way Rob handled himself and how he threw shade at his boss. Hi, Sue. How are you? I am fine, Rob. You asked to see me. What is this about? Well, I was very disappointed in your response to the announcement yesterday. Although Sue tries to remain professional, it's obvious that neither participant is particularly comfortable in the moment. 
Rob's hair seems rather barbed, and although Sue's body language is somewhat neutral, her eyes are exceptionally bulged, perhaps offering a glimpse into the cauldron of repressed anger boiling inside. Let's continue. I think it was unprofessional and put me in a very bad position as your supervisor. I am sorry to hear that, but if you knew what you were doing, I would not have responded that way. Has Rob chosen his best words, allowing for Sue to react professionally? Let's find out. Rob, I have had enough of your childish behavior and lack of respect. Sue has chosen to allow her emotions to boil over, blatantly displaying her contempt for his public comments, erupting like a volcano no longer able to repress the lava inside her. This is obvious in her vocal tone and her body language as she furiously stomps one leg repeatedly and emits spittle with every emphatic word. You can pack up your belongings now. I will have security escort you from the building. Oh snap. Goodbye. Sue's overt lack of restraint escalated to the point of Rob's dismissal, and much as in her personal life, his exit has left her feeling hollow and dissatisfied. Perhaps she could take a different approach that might leave room for discussion and eventual resolution without resorting to extremes. After all, this is work, Sue, and Rob is not your deadbeat boyfriend. Let's observe scenario two. Well, Rob, I am sorry that you feel that way. It's a promising start. Had I known you felt that way, I would have made sure we sat down to discuss this prior to the meeting. Sue extends a proverbial olive branch, giving Rob the sense of being seen and heard, although likely irrelevant. Why don't we sit down and discuss why you think I do not know what I am doing? Oh, so close. Just a sprinkle of passive aggression. Nevertheless, they sit on the same side of the table, facing each other, both leaning slightly forward in an active listening pose. This scenario likely has the best chance of a positive outcome, Sue's crazy eyes notwithstanding. This concludes Module 3 on Conflict Resolution in the Office. Also, Rob, don't be a dick. A mile above Oz, the witch balanced on the wind's forward edge, as if she were a green fleck of the land itself, flung up and sent wheeling away by the turbulent air. Below, the yellow brick road looped back on itself like a relaxed noose. Still it led relentlessly to the Emerald City. The witch could see the companions trudging along, maneuvering around the buckled sections, skirting trenches, skipping when the way was clear. They seemed oblivious to their fate, but it was not up to the witch to enlighten them. Stepping down from the sky like one of her flying monkeys, she finished up on the topmost bough of a black willow tree. Beneath, hidden by the fronds, her prey had paused to take the rest. The witch tucked her broom under her arm. Crab-like and quiet, she scuttled down a little at a time, until she was a mere twenty feet above them. Wind moved the dangling tendrils of the tree. The witch stared and listened. There were four of them. She could see a huge cat of some sort. A, a lion, was it? And a shiny woodman. An animated scarecrow lolled nearby, blowing dandelion heads into the wind. The girl was out of sight behind shifting curtains of the willow. Of course, to hear them tell it, it is the surviving sister who is the crazy one, said the lion. What a witch! Psychologically warped, possessed by demons, insane, not a pretty picture. She was castrated at birth replied the tin woodman calmly. She was born hermaphroditic, or maybe it was entirely male. Oh, you, you see castration everywhere you look, said the lion. I'm only repeating what folks say, said the tin woodman. Well, everyone is entitled to an opinion, said the lion airily. She's a woman who prefers the company of other women, said the scarecrow sitting up. She's the spurned lover of a married man. She is a married man. The witch was so stunned that she nearly lost her grip on the branch. The last thing she ever cared for was gossip, yet she had been out of touch for so long that she was astonished at the vigorous opinions of these random nobodies. In the late 1970s, 
Mattel was the biggest toy company in the world. They had scored big time with their first electric foray, handheld games, and they were ready for more. In late 1979, they test marketed their first video game system. In 1980, Intellivision hit the streets. In 1981, Intellivision changed its focus and began the second unofficial age of Intellivision by releasing hard-hitting print and TV ads that directly compared their graphics to those of Atari's 2600. Intellivision clearly came out on top in these ads and quickly grabbed a 20% market share, outperforming the rest of Mattel. Mattel's aggressive ads were seen as the first shot in a console war, the first of its kind, and the media was quick to respond. Although Coleco had once run head-to-head -head ads against Mattel, comparing handheld games, this was the first such video game ad. For the first time in the brand new video game business, consumers had a choice. At around this time, amid visions of a long and profitable future, Mattel opened Mattel Electronics. The team programmers and designers who make Intellivision's in-house games were called the Blue Sky Rangers. In addition to expanding the Blue Sky Rangers ranks from 20 to more than 100 developers during the heyday of Intellivision, Mattel also attempted to expand the system into something approximating the computer that had been part of the original vision. The first add-on module for the system was Intellivoice, a module that synthesized speech. Games like B-17 Bomber used the voice module effectively. Mattel also promised a keyboard to complete its computer aspirations, but somehow the keyboard never quite made it to market. Finally, Mattel did release a keyboard, but it was a shadow of the promised peripheral. It was, in essence, too little, too late. Mattel eventually attempted to produce the long-awaited computer from scratch, but the resulting Aquarius system was even less impressive and even later than the ill-fated keyboard. Programmers considered it punishment to be assigned to create games for Aquarius. And designer Bob Dell principal slogan for the system, which was released in 1983, was Aquarius, system for the 70s. Perhaps Aquarius would have succeeded in the 70s, but in 1983, it was just in time, along with Coleco's equally ill-fated Atom computer, to see the end of an era. As always, there were many contributing factors. For one, their own advertising which stressed superior graphics, backfired on them when ColecoVision released in 1982 with still better graphics. And second, the fateful year 1984 loomed ahead, and Intellivision's crash, along with the whole industry, was enough to cause Mattel to close down Mattel Electronics. However, Intellivision was not dead. The senior VP of marketing for Mattel Electronics, Terence E. Valesky, bought the rights to the system and continued releasing new games through his INTV Corporation. INTV Corp finally stopped production of the Intellivision system in 1991, more than 10 years after its introduction. With Easter just around the corner, my thoughts turned to a story I heard about a little boy who was filled with doubt about Jesus' resurrection. One night, he had a dream. In that dream, he becomes the size of a bird and found himself on a tree limb, engaged in conversation with a caterpillar. I believe in change. Yes, sirree, commented the caterpillar. Not me, said Joe. All of a sudden, the scene changes, and the caterpillar, now struggling, and a cocoon goes through metamorphosis, becoming a butterfly. Let me help, screamed Joe, hearing and seeing the violent struggle going on, while the caterpillar was obviously trapped in the cocoon. No, pleaded the frantic caterpillar. This is only something God can do. Emerging from the grave like a shroud, the caterpillar... No, wait, it, it wasn't a caterpillar anymore. It was something completely different. It was wet, wrinkled, and still struggling. Finally, completely free, the caterpillar, now a butterfly, was out flapping his wings with all the strength he could muster. As he lifted his head, he flew into the clear blue sky and circled around and around the tree as little Joe watched in amazement. No more crawling around on cabbage leaves for me, Joe, yelled the butterfly in triumph. I've got wings. And then he was gone, and the dream ended. There are so many lessons to be drawn from this story about the many facets of this allegory. The change from caterpillar to butterfly, from an earthly environment to a heavenly, from darkness and struggle, to light and freedom, from the downward pull of Satan, to the upward drawing power of God. How could a caterpillar, if he had a mind like a human, 
ever fathom the difference metamorphosis would make in his life in every aspect. How could the changed caterpillar, now a butterfly, ever explain to the creatures crawling around on cabbage leaves that such a change could even take place? How could he convince creatures crawling around on the ground that life was far more exhilarating as a butterfly, that your whole perspective on the world could be seen from a new vantage point? You must experience this new birth for yourself. You must go through the struggle, you and God alone. Only He can perfect this change. Bring about this new creature. As we watch the unfolding of spring, let it be a reminder of the glorious change that can take place in every life. Allow the change to happen in you. Turn your eyes to the one who can make it possible in your life. I've got wings. Do you? A reading from the book Tangled by Emma Chase. Read by Raimundo S.C. We grab a table in the bar and order. The waitress brings our drinks and Kate takes a sip of the margarita I ordered for her. Mmm, this is just what I wanted right now. Told you I was good at the drink thing, remember? We talk comfortably for a few minutes, and then watch this. Kate's eyes go wide as saucers, and she dives under the table. I look around. What the heck? I duck my head and take a peek at her. What are you doing? She looks panicked. Billy's here, upstairs, in the loft over the dance floor, and he's not alone. I start to lift my head when she yells, Don't look! Good heavens, this is ridiculous. So much for being over the jerk. It's just, I can't let him see me like this. Now I'm confused. What are you talking about? You look great. She always looks great. No, not in these clothes. He said it wasn't attractive that I was so driven. It was one of the reasons he wanted to break up, that I, he said I was too masculine. You have got to be kidding me. I'm masculine. Kate Brooks doesn't have a darn masculine cell in her body. She's all woman, believe me. But I know what that jerk was going for. Kate is intelligent, outspoken, ambitious. Lots of men, like that idiot, for instance, can't handle a woman like that. So they twist it around, make those qualities seem unappealing, something to be ashamed of. Oh, the heck with this. I grab Kate's hand and drag her out from under the table. She looks around quickly as I lead her to the dance floor. What are you doing? Giving you back your dignity. I bump into several people on the way, making a slight ripple, so I'm sure that jerk will notice us. By the time I'm done, Billy Warren will be kissing your feet and any other body part you tell him to, to get you back. She tries to pull out of my grasp. No, Drew, that's not really... I turn to face her and put my arms around her waist. Trust me, Kate. Her body's close to mine, her face so near, I can see the green speckles in her eyes. Why am I doing this again? I'm a guy. I know how we think. No guy wants to see a girl that used to be his with someone else. Just go with me on this. She doesn't answer. She just raises her arms around my neck, bringing us together. It's agony. Exquisite, delicious agony. The music swirls around us, and I feel buzzed, not from the drinks, but from the feel of her. I try to remember my noble intentions. I'm too caught up in the way she's looking at me. I lean in and brush my nose against hers, testing the waters. I press my lips against hers, softly. It's tender at first, and then she melts against me. I forgot how good she tastes, more decadent than the richest chocolate. Who? asked the counselor. The lizards or the kids? Mr. Pendansky laughed grimly. The kids are going to die anyway, (laughs) he laughed again. At least we got plenty of graves to choose from. We've got time, said the warden. I've waited this long. I can wait another few. Her voice trailed off. Stanley felt a lizard crawl in and out of his pocket. We're going to keep our story simple, said the warden. That woman's going to ask a lot of questions. The AG will most likely initiate an investigation. So this is what happened. Stanley tried to run away in the night, fell in a hole, and the lizards got him. That's it. We're not even going to give him Zero's body. As far as anybody knows, Zero doesn't exist. Like Mom said, we got plenty of graves to choose from. Why would he run away if he knew he was getting released today? Asked Mr. Pendansky. Who knows? 
He's crazy. That was why we couldn't release him yesterday. He was delirious, and we had to keep watch over him so he wouldn't hurt himself or anybody else. She's not going to like it, said Mr. Pendansky. She's not going to like anything we tell her, said the warden. She stared at Zero and at the suitcase. Why aren't you dead yet? she asked. Stanley only half listened to the talk of the counselors. He didn't know who that woman was or what A.G. meant. He didn't even realize they were initials. It sounded like one word, age E. His mind was focused on the tiny claws that moved up and down his skin and through his hair. He tried to think about other things. He didn't want to die with the images of the warden, Mr. Sir, and the lizards etched into his brain. Instead, he tried to see his mother's face. His brain took him back to a time when he was very little and all bundled up in a snowsuit. He and his mother were walking, hand in hand, mitten in mitten, when they both slipped on some ice and fell and rolled down a snow-covered hillside. They ended up at the bottom of the hill. He remembered he almost cried, but instead he laughed. His mother laughed too. He could feel the same light-headed feeling he felt then, dizzy from rolling down the hill, He felt the sharp coldness of the snow against his ear. He could see flecks of snow on his mother's bright and cheery face. This was where he wanted to be when he died. Hey, caveman, guess what, said Mr. Sir. You're innocent after all. I thought you'd like to know that. Your lawyer came to get you yesterday. Too bad you weren't here. The words meant nothing to Stanley, who was still in the snow. He and his mother climbed back up the hill and rolled down again this time on purpose. Later, they had hot chocolate with lots of melted marshmallows. From the Messiah's Handbook You teach best what you most need to learn. You're awfully quiet over there, Richard, said Shimoda, as though he wanted to talk with me. Yeah, I said, and went on reading. If this was a book for masters only, I didn't want to let go of it. Live never to be ashamed if anything you do or say is published around the world, even if what is published is not true. Your friends will know you better in the first five minutes you meet than your acquaintances will know you in a thousand years. The best way to avoid responsibility is to say, I've got responsibilities. I noticed something strange about the book. These pages don't have numbers on them, Don. No, he said. You just open it and whatever you need most is there. A magic book. No, you can do it with any book. You can do it with an old newspaper if you read carefully enough. Haven't you done that, hold some problem in your mind and then open any book handy and see what it tells you? No. Well, try it sometime. I tried. I closed my eyes and wondered what was going to happen to me if I stayed much longer with this strange person. It was fun to be with him, but I couldn't shake the sense that something not fun at all was going to happen to him before long. And I didn't want to be around when it did. Thinking that, I opened the book with my eyes still closed, then opened them and read, You are led through your lifetime by the inner learning creature, the playful spiritual being that is your real self. Don't turn away from possible futures before you're certain you don't have anything to learn from them. You're always free to change your mind and choose a different future or a different past. Choose a different past? Literally or figuratively or how did it mean? I think my mind just boggled, Don. I don't know how I could possibly learn this stuff. Practice. A little theory and a lot of practice, he said take you about a week and a half. A week and a half. Yeah. 
Believe you know all the answers and you know all the answers. Believe you're a master and you are. In most of our daily activities, we choose the agenda and develop a strategy to achieve the goal at hand. We create the program. Awareness moves differently. The program is happening around us. The world is the doer and we are the witness. We have little or no control over the content. The gift of awareness allows us to notice what's going on around and inside ourselves in the present moment, and to do so without attachment or involvement. We may observe bodily sensations, passing thoughts and feelings, sounds or visual cues, smells and tastes. Through detached noticing, awareness allows an observed flower to reveal more of itself without our intervention. This is true of all things. Awareness is not a state you force. There is little effort involved, though persistence is key. It's something you actively allow to happen. It is a presence with and acceptance of what is happening in the eternal now. As soon as you label an aspect of source, you're no longer noticing, you're studying. This holds true of any thought that takes you out of presence with the object of your awareness, whether analysis or simply becoming aware that you're aware. Analysis is a secondary function. The awareness happens first as a pure connection with the object of your attention. If something strikes me as interesting or beautiful, first I live that experience. Only afterward might I attempt to understand it. Though we can't change what it is that we are noticing, we can change our ability to notice. We can expand our awareness and narrow it, experience it with our eyes open or closed. We can quiet our inside so we can perceive more on the outside, or quiet the outside so we can notice more of what's happening inside. We can zoom in on something so closely it loses the features that make it what it appears to be, or zoom so far out it seems like something entirely new. The universe is only as large as our perception of it. When we cultivate our awareness, we are expanding the universe. This expands the scope not just the material at our disposal to create from, but of the life we get to live. The ability to look deeply is the root of creativity. To see past the ordinary and mundane and get to what might otherwise be invisible. Good Night Moon By Margaret Wise Brown Pictures by Clement Hurd in the great green room, there was a telephone, and a red balloon, and a picture of the cow jumping over the moon. And there were three little bears sitting on chairs, and two little kittens, and a pair of mittens, and a little toy house, and a young mouse, and a comb, and a brush, and a bowl full of mush, and a quiet old lady who was whispering, Hush! Good night, room. Good night, moon. Good night, cow jumping over the moon. Good night, light and the red balloon. Good night, bears. Good night, chairs. Good night, kittens. And good night, mittens. Good night, clocks. And good night, socks. Good night, little house, and good night, mouse. Good night, comb, and good night, brush. Good night, nobody. Good night, mush. And good night to the old lady, whispering hush. Good night, stars. Good night, air. Good night, noises everywhere. Each ingredient goes into an industrial-sized mixer, starting with white sugar, then brown sugar, then butter. The mixer thoroughly blends these first ingredients until the butter becomes soft and creamy and the sugars are evenly dispersed. Then it's time for the headliner, chocolate chips. 
Next, flour. Followed by baking soda to make the dough rise. And salt to add flavor. The final ingredients are whole eggs beaten. Combined with vanilla made from beans harvested in Madagascar, Africa. Mixing resumes until everything's well blended, which usually takes about five minutes. A gift for my wife. Last weekend, I saw something at the gun show that sparked my interest. I was looking for a little something different for my wife, Nancy. What I came across was a 100,000-volt pocket purse size taser. The effects of the taser were supposed to be short-lived, with no long-term adverse effect on your assailant, allowing her adequate time to retreat to safety. All the while, I'm looking at this little device measuring about five inches long, less than three-quarter inches in circumference, loaded with two little itsy-bitsy AAA batteries. Pretty cute, really, and thinking to myself, there's no possible way. What happened next is almost beyond description, but I'll do my best. I'm sitting there alone, the cat looking on with his head cocked to one side so as to say, Don't do it, stupid! Reasoning that a one-second burst from such a tiny little old thing couldn't hurt that bad. So I decided to give myself a one-second burst just for the heck of it. I touched the prongs to my naked thigh, pushed the button, and holy mother of God, weapons of mass destruction, what the, I am certain I just met Jesus. I vaguely recall waking up on my side in the fetal position with tears in my eyes, body soaking wet, both nipples on fire, testicles nowhere to be found, and tingling in my legs. Note. If you ever feel compelled to mug yourself with a taser, one note of caution. There is no such thing as a one-second burst when you zap yourself. You will not let go of that thing until it is dislodged from your hand by a violent thrashing about on the floor. A three-second burst would be considered conservative. A minute or so later, I can't be sure as time was a relative thing at that point, I collected my wits, what little I had left, sat up and surveyed the landscape. My bent reading glasses were now on top of the TV. The recliner was upside down and about eight feet or so from where it originally was. My triceps, right thigh, and both nipples were still twitching. My face felt like it had been shot up with Novocaine, and my bottom lip, I swear, weighed 88 pounds. My ever-loving wife, she loved the gift and now regularly threatens me with it. The world had teeth, and it could bite you with them anytime it wanted. Trisha McFarland discovered this when she was nine years old. At 10 o'clock on a morning in early June, she was sitting in the back seat of her mother's Dodge Caravan, wearing her blue Red Sox batting practice jersey, the one with 36 Gordon on the back, and playing with Mona, her doll. At 10.30, she was lost in the woods. By 11, she was trying not to be terrified, trying not to let herself think, this is serious, this is very serious. Trying not to think that sometimes when people got lost in the woods, they got seriously hurt. Sometimes they died. All because I needed to pee, she thought. Except she hadn't needed to pee all that badly. And in any case, she could have asked Mom and Pete to wait up the trail a minute while she went behind a tree. They were fighting again. Gosh, what a surprise that was. And that was why she had dropped behind a little bit. And without saying anything. That was why she had stepped off the trail and behind a high stand of bushes. She needed a breather. Simple as that. She was tired of listening to them argue. Tired of trying to sound bright and cheerful. Close to screaming at her mother. Let him go then. If he wants to go back to Malden and live with Dad so much, why don't you just let him? I'd drive him myself if I had a license, just to get some peace and quiet around here. And what then? What would her mother say then? What kind of look would come over her face? And Pete? He was older, almost 14, and not stupid. 
So why didn't he know better? Why couldn't he just give it a rest? Cut the crap, was what she wanted to say to him. To both of them, really. Just cut the crap. The divorce had happened a year ago, and their mother had gotten custody. Pete had protested the move from suburban Boston to southern Maine bitterly and at length. Part of it really was wanting to be with Dad. And that was the lever he always used on Mom. He understood with some unerring instinct that it was the one he could plant the deepest and pull on the hardest. But Trisha knew it wasn't the only reason, or even the biggest one. The real reason Pete wanted out was that he hated Sanford Middle School. In Malden, he had it pretty well whipped. He'd run the computer club like it was his own private kingdom. He'd had friends, nerds, yeah, but they went around in a group and the bad kids didn't pick on them. At Sanford Middle, there was no computer club, and he'd only made a single friend, Eddie Rayburn. Then, in January, Eddie moved away, also the victim of a parental breakup. That made Pete a loner, anyone's game. Worse, a lot of kids laughed at him. He had picked up a nickname which he hated, Pete's Copy World. On most of the weekends when she and Pete didn't go down to Malden to be with their father, their mother took them out on outings. She was grimly dedicated to these, and although Trisha wished with all her heart that Mom would stop, she knew that wasn't going to happen. The bean fields and mountains of North Carolina are five time zones and more than 5,000 miles from Hawaii. But such differences are trifles compared to the determination of youth. 11-year-old Harrison Johnson from North Carolina has raised $81,000 to help fund history projects to tell the story of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The money was raised by collecting donations door-to-door, selling patriotic popsicles, and public speaking events, yes, by Harrison himself. But what brought this spark of patriotic fervor out in this boy's heart when he had never even seen the famous harbor on Oahu? Well, according to news radio WRAL in Raleigh, it began in school with a history project. The particulars of the event fascinated Harrison, who began to study it recreationally, reading books and old newspaper accounts, and even speaking to survivors of the attack. Following a visit to the Pearl Harbor National Memorial in Oahu, Harrison was motivated to start a campaign to ensure that the heroes and victims of the date, which will live in infamy, are never forgotten. His fundraising campaign, called Harrison's Heroes, is looking to raise $100,000 for Pacific Historic Parks, the nonprofit that stewards the Pearl Harbor National Memorial. In particular, Harrison hopes that it can produce material that expands the history of the attack to include heroic acts from men and women of color and other underrepresented members. If you would like to donate to Harrison's Heroes, go to PacificHistoricParks.org, click on Ways to Give, and then Harrison's Heroes. The Seneca Falls Convention was the first women's rights convention in the United States. Held in July 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, the meeting launched the women's suffrage movement, which more than seven decades later ensured women the right to vote. The meeting was organized by five women who were also active in the abolitionist movement and their names were Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Mary McClintock, Martha Coffin Wright, and Jane Hunt. One attendee of the convention was Charlotte Woodward, who was 19 years old when she signed the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention on July 19, 1848. The convention at Seneca Falls would grow into a movement that would soon gain allies such as Susan B. Anthony, who would spend the next 50 years advocating for women's suffrage. Finally, in 1920, the U.S. ratified the 19th Amendment, securing women's constitutional right to vote. Charlotte Woodward was the only Seneca Falls attendee who lived to see that great moment of change. She was 91 years old when she was finally eligible to vote, but her health issues prevented her from going to the polls to cast her vote. The Bee Sting by Paul Murray It's so dark, you can hardly make her out now. A shadow among shadows. The staircase feeling of earlier has gone. You're in the basement now. And she must feel the same, because her voice comes thinly out of the dark. Tell me some science. 
Science. One of your facts. Tell me something. I need some distraction. Okay, you say. Any particular area of science? Anything. You think for a moment. Did you know that there are more bacterial cells in your body than human cells? Seriously? Way more. You have 500 different species of bacteria just in your intestine. There's enough bacteria inside you to fill a two-liter bottle. Some human genes originally came from bacteria. Well, that's disgusting, she says. Yeah, you say. But it's interesting. People get so hung up on, are they this kind of person or that? But if you have 10 times more not-human cells than human cells, then in a way, you're not even you. It kind of takes the pressure off, you say. I feel like if people knew they were mostly bacteria, it would solve a lot of problems. Cass laughs. You're definitely you, she says. Whatever about the bacteria, you're you, 100%. She shakes her head. And for a moment, you get this surge of happiness, there in the wind and the rain, as if somehow the future will actually be okay, in spite of everything. Then Cass says, Hey, look, isn't that that weird tree? Oh, yeah, you say. We must have been going in the right direction after all. The way we eat has changed more in the last 50 years than in the previous 10,000. But the image that's used to sell the food is still the imagery of agrarian America. You go into the supermarket and you see pictures of the farmers, the picket fence, the silo, and the 30s farmhouse with the green grass. It's the spinning of this pastoral fantasy. The modern American supermarket has, on average, 47,000 products. There are no seasons in the American supermarket. Now there are tomatoes all year round grown halfway around the world, picked when it was green and ripened with ethylene gas. Although it looks like a tomato, it's kind of a notional tomato. I mean, it's the idea of a tomato. In the meat aisle, there are no bones anymore. There is this deliberate veil, this curtain that's dropped between us and where our food is coming from. The industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating, because if you knew, you might not want to eat it. If you follow the food chain back from those shrink wrap packages of meat, you'll find a very different reality. The reality is, it's not a farm, it's a factory. That meat is being processed by huge multinational corporations that have very little to do with ranches and farmers. Now our food is coming from enormous assembly lines where the animals and the workers are being abused. And the food has become much more dangerous in ways that are being deliberately hidden from us. Welcome to the Profound Teachings of the Law of One, a spiritual text channeled in the 1980s by LL Research, where the entity Ra imparts wisdom on the nature of reality and human existence. At its core is the concept of unity, 
highlighting the interconnectedness of all things in the universe. Central to this philosophy are the seven densities of consciousness, each represented by a color of the spectrum. Red signifies the first density, where basic awareness and survival instincts prevail. Moving to the second density, represented by orange, beings experience growth and movement, evolving towards a more complex interactions with their environment. Humanity currently resides in the third density, symbolized by yellow, where self-awareness and individuality emerge, allowing us to explore the complexities of existence. As we progress, we encounter the fourth density, depicted by the color green, which emphasizes love and understanding. Here, beings recognize the interconnectedness of all life and prioritize compassion and unity. Beyond lies the fifth, sixth, and seventh densities, each associated with higher states of consciousness and culminating in the violet seventh density, where beings exist in a pure unity with the Creator. Throughout this journey, the Law of One stresses the importance of balance. By integrating both positive and negative experiences, we evolve spiritually and manifest our highest potential. Embracing unity and balance, we navigate our paths towards enlightenment, both as individuals and as a collective consciousness. Diving in the Florida Keys can provide you with opportunities to see aquatic species that are both native and invasive. The farther the spine goes into your meat, the more venom you get. Captain Brandon Simmons is exploring multiple depths with a local legend who has a taste for seafood. Oh yeah, I got one. Nice tuna. There we go. All right. And a restaurant that can prepare just about anything. That looks incredible. Lionfish tempura benedict. I think we're the only place that does this. West Marines Life on the Water, presented by Costa Custom Boats. The Florida Keys offer a chance for visitors to fully immerse themselves in a life on the water. With miles of shallow reefs to explore, it's one of the most popular diving destinations in America. The reefs off the Florida Keys, you know, are abundant with life. But, uh, you know, over the last 20 or so years, we've been introduced to a new type of fish that we're not used to having here. Our reefs aren't used to having. They don't really have any predators, and those are the lionfish. And, you know, they've really impacted a lot of our fisheries. They're definitely an invasive species and something that we need to try to combat. They taste great, so it's always nice to go out, get them, and cook them up for a, a good, nice, fresh dinner of lionfish. Before just about any trip, Brandon visits the local West Marine to get the supplies he needs for a successful adventure. Manny. What's up, Brandon? How are you? Pretty good yourself? Good, man. So check it out. I'm going to do some cleanup on the reef. We're going looking for some lionfish, and I need a, you know, an application. Maybe so you want some pole spears? spears? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I got some over in, the, in diving if you want to go check it out. Cool, man. Appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, thank you. Today, Brandon is going lionfish hunting with two of the most experienced divers in the Keys, John Mirabella and the man who goes by one name, Schwanky. With conditions working in their favor, Brandon Simmons is headed down to the bottom where a small shipwreck is likely holding a variety of aquatic life and possibly the lionfish that he and his two diving partners, John Mirabella and Schwanky, are looking for. 